And the angel said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Luke 2.30 For nearly 2,000 years, the birth story of Jesus Christ has inspired millions. Generation after generation has been moved by its miracles, its majesty, and its simple humanity. But for many scholars, the Christmas story remains an unsolvable enigma. For centuries, pilgrims have flocked here to Bethlehem to worship at the sacred spot where it is believed Jesus was born. Have they all been coming to the wrong place? A number of scholars today would argue that probably Nazareth is more likely to have been the birthplace of Jesus rather than Bethlehem. It is not just the location that is open to question, but the time. Is Christmas being celebrated in the wrong season? The date of December 25th is uh, purely legendary. We do not know uh, the date of the birth of Jesus nor the month. The essence and spirit of Christmas are immortal. It is just the details of the story that puzzle scholars to this day. Almost everything about the birth of Jesus could be put in the category of mystery. Can we ever know when Jesus was born? Who were the legendary wise men? And what was the star they saw in the East? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Luke 2, 8. The timeless elements of the Christmas story, a familiar tale beloved by Christians around the world. But the Christmas story is also a profound mystery, for there is precious little historical evidence to support the Bible's telling of the holy birth. And even the Gospels themselves give varying accounts of the birth of Jesus, accounts which seldom agree with one another. It's probably true that there are more mysteries than facts about the birth of Jesus. We don't know really when he was born. We don't know where he was born. And if you go into the virginal conception, virginal birth, we don't know how he was born in that sense, how he was conceived in that sense. So we almost don't know anything that we would want to know. It is the year 66 in the Common Era. The Gospels have not yet been written. In Judea, decades of Jewish resentment against Roman rule explode into war. The victorious Romans burn the temple, holiest sanctuary of the Jewish faith. Without the temple and its priesthood, the Jews are without a spiritual center. There are bitter arguments over what is true religion and what is heresy. It is a time of turmoil for Jews, 
and for Jewish Christians like the evangelist Matthew. Baptist groups, Christian groups, and others uh, no longer felt welcome. And uh, Matthew's gospel, as well as John, seems to be responding to this uh, sense of, uh, of alienation and this sense of being pushed out. Jewish Christians hold on to their belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the long-awaited savior of the Jewish people. For this reason, many scholars believe that when Matthew writes his gospel, he deliberately links Jesus with earlier heroes of Israel. The murder of the infants, for example, may go back to a similar threat on Moses' life when the Pharaoh ordered all firstborn infants murdered. Uh, the trip that Joseph and Mary and Jesus take to Egypt may again reflect the kind of trip that Joseph in the Old Testament made. The um, uh, star uh, in uh, Matthew's story may go back to a star mentioned in the book of Numbers. Uh, the reference to magi or kings may go back to a reference in Isaiah. The mystery of Matthew's birth story may lie in the ancient traditions of the Jewish people. Besides Matthew, only one other gospel, the Gospel of Luke, tells the story of the birth of Jesus. A clue to the mystery of Luke's birth story may lie in its opening chapter, which portrays Joseph and Mary journeying to Bethlehem to be taxed at a time when memories of the failed Jewish rebellion against Rome were still painfully fresh. In Luke's story, by having uh, Joseph and Mary obediently follow the orders uh, of the emperor, orders which hadn't been uh, followed by other Jews, it indicates that Christians themselves uh, were not a political threat uh, to the Roman Empire, and hence uh, people could join the uh, movement. The story of Christmas the world knows so well comes entirely from the accounts of Matthew and Luke. But Matthew and Luke wrote these accounts some 70 years after the time Jesus is believed to have been born. Can stories written so long after the birth of Jesus be relied upon to be historically accurate? Neither of these stories is historically accurate and neither of them intends to be historically accurate. Neither of them knows exactly what happens and that is why they can be so different. It, it's not their problem, it is our problem if we read them as history. It seems to me story is the primary way in which God communicates with us. Was there really a star? Were there really magi? Uh, did this or that particular event happen or not? All of those are interesting questions, but they don't get at the heart of the matter, which is the primacy of the story. That is to say that what we as Christians do is tell the story of Jesus in such wise that his story becomes our story. In the Gospel of Luke, Joseph and Mary leave their home in Nazareth and journey to Joseph's birthplace of Bethlehem to be counted in a Roman census. Finding no room at Bethlehem's inn, Joseph and Mary and their newborn son take shelter in a humble stable, which the Bible calls a manger. In contrast to Luke's story, the Gospel of Matthew says simply that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. For Matthew, the birth itself is not as important as the dark and mysterious drama that follows it. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Matthew 2, 2. But in Luke's account, there is no star shining in the heavens, and there are no wise men. Instead, shepherds watching their flocks near Bethlehem are suddenly dazzled by a powerful vision. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
lying in a manger. Luke 2, 11. Beyond the Gospel's disagreements, a deeper question lies. What could have sparked the earliest speculations about how the Son of God was born? The earliest New Testament writings suggest nothing unusual about the birth of Jesus. The earliest statement we have about Jesus' birth is in one of Paul's letters. In Galatians 4.4, 4, there is a short statement that says that Jesus is born of a woman, born under the law. And what's interesting about it is that the phrases, born of a woman, born of a law, suggest that there was nothing extraordinary about Jesus' birth, since all of us are born of women, and all of us are born under the laws and customs and, and just general um, rules of a society. The Gospels of Mark and John make no mention of the holy birth, but some believe that the opening chapters of Mark's Gospel, believed to be the first Gospel written, may have provided some inspiration to Matthew and Luke. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending on him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mark 1, 9. I think what happened is that the writers of Matthew and Luke saw the opening line of Mark, which they used as one of their narrative sources, and asked the question, how in the world did it come to be that Jesus was the Son of God? In Matthew's Gospel, it is the newborn Son of God whose birth so troubles King Herod. Herod consults his advisors who confirm his worst fears. An ancient prophecy foretells that the true King of the Jews will be born in Bethlehem. So Herod sends the wise men to Bethlehem and gives them a chilling command. Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Matthew 2, 8. As Matthew's story continues, the wise men worship the infant Jesus and give him rare and precious gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Warned by a dream not to return to Herod, the wise men leave for their own country. An angel warns Joseph of Herod's deadly plan. Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Matthew 2.13 Furious at the Holy Family's escape, Herod gives a brutal order. He commands that every male child in Bethlehem under the age of two be slaughtered. His soldiers carry out the frightful massacre. Joseph and Mary hide Jesus in Egypt until Herod dies. At the end of Matthew's story, they return to their native land. Over the centuries, Christian tradition has combined Matthew's and Luke's birth stories into one. But in fact, the two stories have very little in common. There are only three areas where the two stories really agree. One is that Jesus' parents were named Joseph and Mary. Second, that the birth was in Bethlehem. And third, that there was something extraordinary about the birth. In the end, the mystery remains. There is little historical evidence to support the Gospel's account of the holy birth. And even the Gospels tell different versions of the story. Scholarly confirmation remains separate 
from matters of faith. But the Gospels do agree on some things. One of these is the birthplace of the Holy Child. Yet here again, history raises many intriguing questions about where Jesus may actually have been born. It is Christmas, and the little town of Bethlehem takes to the streets in celebration, as it does every year. For according to the Bible, Bethlehem is the place where Christmas began. Christians from around the world come to worship and celebrate in the Church of the Nativity, built on the spot where the Christ was born. Outside, Manger Square blazes with modern images of the ancient holy tale. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Matthew 2, 10. Beneath the Church of the Nativity lies the Nativity Grotto, one of the holiest sites in Christendom. For centuries, Christians have revered it as the birthplace of their Lord. A silver star marks the spot where Jesus is said to have been born. In the ancient Latin tongue of the Church Fathers, the inscription proclaims, Hic de Virgine Maria Jesus Christus Natus Est. Here Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. It is a place which feels saturated with holiness and tradition, firmly anchoring the faith of the millions who come to worship here. But according to some scholars, the place they worship was sanctified not by the birth of Jesus, but by a Roman emperor's whim. At the beginning of the fourth century, Constantine the Roman emperor was converted to Christianity. And almost immediately, he decided that he wanted to find and build basilicas on the sacred sites in the Jewish homeland. He wanted, for example, to find the spot of the nativity and then build the church of the nativity upon it. Naturally, he had to find a place. And he found a place. That is the place where nativity is celebrated. Was it the actual place where the nativity occurred? I doubt it. The number of scholars today would argue that probably Nazareth is more likely to have been the birthplace of Jesus rather than Bethlehem, in large part because the birth stories themselves are so late, so legendary, and generally uh, fit scriptural predictions. In fact, the naming of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus may have little to do with history, and a lot to do with the sacred traditions of the Bible. But thou, Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Micah 5, 2. To New Testament writers, the Old Testament prophecies spoke loud and clear. The Messiah would be a descendant of King David, one of Israel's greatest leaders, who was born in Bethlehem. To fulfill these ancient prophecies, the Davidic prophecies, it may have seemed necessary to the Gospel writers to place the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. It's like in American history, we say somebody was born in a log cabin, we think immediately of Lincoln. So, born in Bethlehem equals David, born in the log cabin equals Lincoln. A first century person would immediately get the message. 
But is the prophecy being fulfilled? Or is history being written to fulfill the prophecy? As early as the second century of the Common Era, worshippers of Jesus honored a cave at Bethlehem as his birthplace. But this tradition is found nowhere in the Gospels. Luke says that Joseph and Mary laid the newborn Jesus in a manger, but does not say he was born there. By the 4th century, the cave site was so well known that the Emperor Constantine erected the Church of the Nativity on top of it. But by this time, Bethlehem was also associated with a pagan god, a god who was worshipped centuries before Jesus was born. There is at least one tradition that says that after Jesus' birth and after the rise of early Christianity, it was also used as the site of a shrine to a pagan god, Adonis, a dying and rising god, which would make it all the more um, intriguing. Beautiful and doomed, Adonis was the lover of Venus, Roman goddess of fertility and love. In their myth, Adonis dies a tragic death each year. And every year, as the spring crops ripen, the goddess grants him life anew. It was in its own way a resurrection story. Worshippers of Adonis wept for his death and celebrated his return to life. They did so at the holy site in Bethlehem. In the fourth century, a disgusted Christian wrote, in the cave where the Christ child once cried, they wept for Venus's lover. This coincidence has intrigued many scholars, but most concede that the precise location of the birth of Jesus remains a mystery. I don't think this is, in, in my own mind, not a hindrance to, to those of us who would like to make uh, Christian pilgrimages to, to these sites, because um, we know that it happened within that area. I mean, you're within a stone's throw, so to speak, of where these events actually happen when you are in these shrines, in my opinion. And so the question of Bethlehem's association with the birth of Jesus remains unanswered. But there is another fascinating enigma associated with this city and with the Holy Child, the Star of Bethlehem. Can this famous phenomenon reveal more about the Holy Birth? If history cannot solve the riddles surrounding the birth of Jesus, perhaps science can read them in the stars. Nearly 2,000 years ago, something powerful and unusual happened in the night sky. A heavenly sign that the Son of God had been born on earth. So says the Gospel of Matthew. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Matthew 2, 9. For centuries, astronomers like John Mosley have wondered what the wise men saw in the night sky that sent them west to seek the infant Jesus. Today, when people try to identify the star with an astronomical object, they talk about conjunctions. A conjunction of planets is when one planet passes another. And we know that to astrologers, who were the people who were watching the sky at this time, planetary conjunctions had great significance. We can recreate planetary conjunctions that have happened in the past, going back thousands of years with great precision. We know where the planets were at the time of the birth of Jesus with much greater accuracy than the Magi 
knew and they could watch them. Ancient records tell us that Judea's infamous King Herod died after an eclipse of the moon, but before the Jewish spring festival of Passover. Astronomers have combed their own records looking for the ancient eclipse that preceded Herod's death. People have chosen an eclipse that happened in the spring of 4 BC as the one associated with Herod's death and have put Herod's death in 4 BC. But there are other contenders. For example, there was a widely observed eclipse that was total in January of 1 BC. In the year one before the Common Era, some spectacular celestial activity had just occurred which might well support Matthew's account of the wise men and the star of Bethlehem. Several times during the years 3 and 2 BCE, the planet Jupiter moved unusually close to the planet Venus and the star named Regulus. In the summer of the year 2 BCE, the most astonishing of these conjunctions took place. And at that time, the planets were so close that Venus actually overlapped Jupiter. Extremely rare. If the Magi had had a telescope, they would have seen Venus slightly in front of Jupiter. What they did see was a now dark western sky with the two brightest planets so close that their light merged into one single gleaming beacon in the west. And the two planets then set shortly after 10 o'clock that night. And anybody who watched it, if I'd watched it, any amateur astronomer, any professional astronomer, an astrologer, would have been impressed by the two brightest planets being so close that their light merged. And that happened on June 17th, 2 BC. In the summer of 2 BCE, while the planets Jupiter and Venus were converging, native North Americans living in what is now Ohio were constructing huge, mysterious ritual mounds. In Mexico, the Olmecs were using one of the earliest calendars in the Americas. And in China, soldiers were using the crossbow to defend the Great Wall against barbarian invaders. While astronomy may provide some intriguing support for the existence of the Star of Bethlehem, there remains another question, another mystery in the Bible's telling of the Holy Birth. Who were the Magi, the famous three wise men? And is there any evidence that they existed? Over the centuries, the mysterious Magi have become the beloved three kings of Christmas pageantry. By the early Middle Ages, some 500 years after Matthew wrote, popular imagination had turned the wise men into three Eastern potentates and named them Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar, names we still use today. There were already intriguing stories that one of the three kings, Balthazar, was a black man, a belief that survives in our own Christian myths, which often portray the three kings as of three different races. Yet none of these popular traditions can be traced to Matthew's story. The Gospel tells us only that the men who followed the star were from the east and that they were wise. In a sense, there's no more ironic scene in the entire gospel tradition than these great figures from the East coming to pay obeisance or give worship to this child who's sitting on the knees of a peasant woman in a peasant worker's hut. But history holds other clues to the Magi's identity. In the fifth century before the Common Era, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about the powerful priests of the Medes. These priests had special powers to interpret dreams. Herodotus called them Magi. Our word magic comes from this name. By Matthew's time, the term Magi meant all respectable scientists and astronomers who lived in the lands east of the Roman Empire. To the east lay the mighty Persian Empire and the ancient city of Babylon, where wise men had been studying the stars for thousands of years. 
these magi would have had the skill to detect an unusual conjunction of the planets. They would also have had the knowledge to connect a celestial occurrence to the ancient destiny of Israel. Jews had been captive in Babylon some six centuries earlier, and so it's entirely likely that the Magi knew about the Jewish prophecies. So it's quite natural to think that when the Magi saw this sign, they would have linked it with prophecies relating to the destiny of the Jewish nation. So it all fits together. Were the Magi ancient Babylonian astrologers? And did they already know about the Hebrew prophecies of a Messiah whose coming would be heralded by a star? While science and history may eventually shed some light on the Star of Bethlehem and the Magi, many questions about the Holy Child are not so easy to answer. The virgin birth is one of the greatest miracles in the story of Jesus and also one of its most puzzling enigmas. For believers, it is a matter of faith. For scholars, a mystery to be investigated. Nazareth hallowed by Christians as the home of Jesus Christ. Dominating the city is the magnificent Church of the Annunciation, built atop an ancient grotto which, for centuries, has been one of Christianity's holiest sites. The church was built on the traditional site of the house of Mary and Joseph. The cave of the Annunciation, thought to have been the dwelling place of the Holy Family, lies beneath the church. According to the Bible, it was here that the Virgin Mary heard the incredible, frightening, joyful news of a miraculous child growing in her womb. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke 2, 34. The virgin birth is at the heart of the Christian faith, and for many believers not to be questioned. And yet, modern scholars across the spectrum of opinion search for a guiding meaning to this immortal story. The very idea of a virgin birth is something that uh, transcends our understanding. The events that we're reading in the infancy narratives are events that have to do with God entering the historical process. And that's why I believe that a person who's not open to the possibility of God entering the historical process in a very tangible and real way is not going to get very far with the meaning of those events. The major question is whether the virgin birth is to be taken literally as a biological statement about Mary or theologically as a statement about Jesus. Is there an explanation of the virgin birth? Or will it forever remain a mystery of faith? Scholars seeking answers have begun with an ancient biblical prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7:14. Some 700 years before Matthew would write his gospel, Isaiah's prophecy of a miraculous birth rang out over Israel. In Isaiah's day, however, the Hebrew word for the mother of the child did not mean virgin. It meant simply young woman. Did Isaiah, when he said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, 
was he aware of what he was saying in the sense of how this would be applied by early Christians to Jesus? I think not. He was saying that a young woman in the royal court, she will bear a son and we have high hopes for this son. But the point in early Christianity is that the young woman um, Mary bears a son for whom early Christians have even higher hopes than any figure in a royal court. Some scholars believe the idea of a virgin birth comes from a source radically different from Isaiah's prophecy, from traditions which existed long before the New Testament and most of the Old Testament. Very often it was the Divine Father Zeus who had of sexual relationships with a young woman, a virgin woman, and the birth uh, that resulted was um, Dionysus or Heracles or one of the great heroes of renown. Early Christians before they were Christians used those stories uh, to valorize their own lives, to give models and, and uh, strength to themselves. In fact, one would be shocked not to find uh, stories of the virgin birth, the divine birth, divine parentage on one side of uh, Jesus. In fact, mythology's list of virgin births is impressive and goes back long before the time of Jesus. It is well known that Romulus and Remus, the twin founders of Rome, were raised by a she-wolf. But it is less well known that their father was the god Mars and that their mother was a virgin. The Buddha's mother dreamed of him entering her womb as a snow-white elephant. Cyrus the Great, founder of the Persian Empire, and the Egyptian pharaohs were among the celebrated offspring of gods and virgins. Was the most extraordinary miracle of the Christmas story a common mythological theme of its time? Or was it, as devout Christians believe, a single decisive event in history? The answer is forever lost to science. But the question will be forever asked and will forever cause controversy among scholars and Christians. The question is whether uh, the church would really have depended on secular parallels or Hellenistic parallels which have idolatrous or polytheistic associations in the mind of these early Christians who were very committed to the monotheistic tradition of Judaism. The presentation of Jesus born from a virgin, born from the Holy Spirit, whatever it might have meant to Jews would have been very attractive to non-Jews of the time. This is the kind of thing that would have been uh, appealing to people in the Greco-Roman world. The virginal conception doesn't deny the humanness of Jesus. It puts stress on his origins in the Spirit of God. Whatever we say about his divine origins or his divinity itself should not in any way deny the fullness of his humanity because if it does then we're not talking about the Jesus that Christian faith has always uh, believed in. Perhaps the greatest of all the mysteries surrounding the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth seems destined to remain a mystery. A powerful sign from God to those who believe in it and a powerful enigma to those who question it. But there are some questions which history can answer. Those answers, however, may be very different from some of the world's best-known traditions. Christmas, celebrated as the birthday of Jesus, brings to mind beloved images of winter and softly falling snow. Yet there is no historical basis, not even in the Gospels themselves, for placing the birthday of Jesus near the end of the year. Is it possible that Jesus was born in an entirely different season? Five hundred years after the birth of Jesus, the faith his birth inspired had become the dominant religion of the Western world.
But Christians were still using a pagan calendar. They numbered years from the reign of the notorious Emperor Diocletian, a well-known persecutor of Christians. Diocletian began his rule in the third century after Christ. It would take two centuries more until, in the year 533 CE, Christians decided enough was enough. Church fathers decided that rather than count years from the beginning of the reign of a impious, non-Christian Roman emperor, that they should count the years with the birth of Jesus. And so Dionysius Exiguus, a monk living in Rome, was given the project of determining when precisely Jesus was born. Given his marching orders, Dionysius Exiguus, whose Latin name meant Dennis the Short, started digging through the archives of the church, searching for the true date of the birth of Jesus. Eventually, he decided that Jesus had been born 754 years after the founding of Rome. To this day, no one knows why he picked this number. He renamed it the Year One of Our Lord, in Latin, Anno Domini. But not everyone was happy with his decision. Dionysius used the best information he had, but the early church fathers and historians who had looked into this weren't unanimous at that time. So they had to pick a date, and they picked the best date, and he was the one assigned to do it, and they used his date. But I don't think it was unanimous ever. Nevertheless, Dionysius Exiguus declared, apparently without evidence, that the year one had commenced on January 1st, precisely 533 years earlier. Christians of Dionysius' time did agree that the holy birth had taken place on December 25th. But for the first 300 years after Jesus lived and died, December 25th was not Christmas. Christians celebrated the birth of Jesus on an entirely different day. The birth um, of Jesus originally was celebrated along with the visit of the Magi and the baptism on January 6th. And we have evidence for that as early as uh, the end of the second century, beginning of the third. Others uh, place the birth of Christ um, as late as um, uh, April 21st or May 1st. Uh, the date of December 25th does not uh, come around until uh, the fourth century. Today, no one knows why early Christians celebrated the birth of Jesus in January, April, or May. But an ancient story reveals why, in the fourth century, Christians began to celebrate Christmas on December 25th. The answer lies in the traditions of a powerful pagan god. The sun's unconquerable power and dazzling majesty made it a favorite deity of Roman emperors. The Romans believed that the sun was reborn each year at the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. On that day, the sun vanquished winter's cold and darkness, bringing new life with the warmer, longer days of spring. Today, the winter solstice falls on December 21st, but for the Romans, the winter solstice fell on December 25th, a day they declared holy to the sun. On December 25th, worshippers of the sun lit candles in its honor. They feasted and offered each other gifts. It was an immensely popular celebration in which Christians freely participated. The church disapproved of its members celebrating with pagans, but nothing could separate Christians from this festive pagan holiday. And so, sometime around the year 300 CE, church leaders made a very practical decision. Christians seem to have um, placed their birth of Christ at the same time as this festival, December 25th, as a way of countering this festival and asserting that uh, Jesus himself had overcome the forces of darkness and had become the son of righteousness, a phrase which comes from the Old Testament prophets. 
We may never know with scientific certainty just when and where Jesus Christ was born. But regardless of what is known or unknown, Christians will continue to celebrate the miracle of their Savior's birth on the day and in the place their faith proclaims, a sacred tradition nearly 2,000 years old. Well, the birth stories shouldn't necessarily be looked at as to their amount of historical uh, credibility. It seems to me that what the Christians of the late first century and early second centuries were doing was creating a world, a Christian world, for Christians to inhabit, a world that had its own heroes, its own figures, its own stories, and the birth stories are part of that tradition process. It would be a horrible thing if we decided that the infancy narratives were not historical or not factual, and therefore we would no longer tell the story. The story continues to live, and it lives in our hearts and in our minds to the degree that we allow ourselves to be drawn into the story, like any great story. The story of Jesus resonates with profound human experience. Its truth lies in the fact that in the mystery of Jesus, we find the mystery of ourselves. For many, the meaning of Jesus' birth comes not from knowing how it happened, but in celebrating the wisdom, the sacred message that Jesus brought to humankind. For those who seek answers, the events surrounding the birth of the Holy Child remain one of the enduring mysteries of the Bible. For others, the when and where of this timeless moment are much less important than the why why their faith is meaningful, why they believe the way they do.